Hello, it's time for another Q&A, and as in the other ones, I have to state from the beginning, I'm not a physician, so I can't prescribe treatment or medication and that kind of stuff, but I can give you some good advice based on my knowledge on dry fasting. So let's get into it. Okay, first question is, you mentioned in your book, The Phoenix Protocol, to take cold or cool showers while dry fasting. Is it okay to take warm or hot showers or baths during dry fasting? Of course it is. Whatever is more comfortable. I mean, during the hot weather, I kind of like the cold bath. During the hot weather or cold weather, I like to take a warm bath. Um, however, almost universally, I like to take baths with septum salts and just float and soak for 5, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And of course, I end my fast that way. But yeah, just whatever's more comfortable. You don't have to be cold. You don't have to be hot. You do whatever you want to do. It's specific to your experience. If you need to get into a, a cool situation, there you go. You got the, you got the shower or the bath. And the, the doctors specifically from Russia indicate that you need to take water on the skin. So it goes through the skin, flushes out the lymphatic system, and helps you detox. So yeah, water is really important. Next question. Uh, is it okay to take an enema when dry fasting because I feel constipated and I can't go to the toilet? Well, of course, absolutely. If you're that backed up, please do an enema. Clear out that bowel, make yourself feel better. Usually around the two, third or second day into a dry fast, I go ahead and do a, an enema, so just a clean water enema. And then after the dry fast, I do it. Uh, women have noticed that if they do a fa an enema before the fast, it's easier for them. They don't get constipated. And uh, so really, whatever, whatever your need is, just use it. Uh, unwarranted multiple enemas probably aren't the way to go. But if you need an enema to clear some constipation, perfect, do it. Okay, uh, third question. I felt, doing, I felt great during the uh, seven day dry fast, but crashed as soon as I finished it during the recovery period and I got weak and listless. What happened? Did I do something wrong? Uh, probably you exercised too much or were too active. When you get through a dry fast, you're ready to go, but your body's not. You've got to start up slowly. You've just taken your body into seven days of deliberate starvation therapy, which means you've caused all kinds of other metabolic processes to turn on that are very beneficial for longevity, but it's also very hard in the body. It takes time to get those brand new cells toughened up so they can take it. You want to start your digestive system slowly. That's why we just say the liquids at the beginning. You want to start your pancreas slowly. That's why I say keep the sugars down. Don't do that because your body can make sugar from fats and proteins. It doesn't need carbohydrates. So that's, in fact, it's nothing the body actually is re required. Okay, so just uh, uh, just take it easy. You got to take it easy. You just put yourself through a week worth of therapy in a hospital, and you're going to be weak, so to speak. And just sort of go with it. Um, I've noticed that you'll especially with myself, for instance, I'll get really excited to do something, I'll start doing it, I'll get into it, and then I'll lose all the steam in the middle of it. Because my mind's ready, but the body's not yet. So you've got to be cognizant of what you've done and how to, how to repair that quickly and to restore it over the same period of time that you fasted. That's the rule of thumb. Uh, let's see. Um, number four, I'd rather, I had rather intense back pain for three or four days during my dry fast. Was that because I was dehydrated? Uh, the pain did disappear as, uh, as fast as it started, but just wondered why that happened. And well, we've seen this a lot. It's not necessarily from dehydration. A lot of the times it's from prior injuries. Um, I've had some headaches from falling off ladders onto my head. Um, I've had some knee aches from falling on the knee. I've had a shoulder ache up here from a bicycling accident back in college that doesn't bother me now, thanks to dry fasting. So it takes time for dry fast to go and fix these things that really weren't fixed. Enough metabolic band-aids were put on top of them so you can keep going, but they really weren't fixed because sleep isn't long enough to fix those kind of damages. Dry fasting is, but not sleep. So that's really kind of where you're going with that. Um, if you have pain, uh, just take it easy. Put a hot water bottle on it. That usually takes care of it. Um, a lot of women have had problems in their, in their pelvic area from childbearing and, or falling and in, in accidents. Um, it's just whatever you've been through will sometimes relate to a pain, an oddball pain out of nowhere that you, you think, oh my gosh, there's something wrong. Well, no, that wrong happened long ago. And now dry fasting is trying to rip the band-aids off and fix the problem. All right, next one. Uh, number five, I am underweight and have very little body fat. Should I still dry fast? Well, of course. 
there's a lot more weight than you think you have. And even if it does run out of that, it'll, the body will start going for the broken proteins, misfolded proteins, the scar tissues, damaged tissues, all that kind of stuff. Because although there's, uh, you know, maybe 10% of water in fat cells, there's 85 to 90% of water in cells that are burning out. So you have plenty of water, you'll break those cells up, it's fine. Now the cool thing about fasting is, dry fasting is a hormetic stress. Years and years ago, like 90,000 years ago, when we were out hunting, and we couldn't find food for two or three days, that fat was put on the body for that type of period. Fat is your emergency source of fuel for two things, your blood and your brain. Without those two things, you just can't go on. So that's what the, the fat really represents. It's really your ancestral backup to make sure you don't die. Uh, unfortunately, these days, with the amount of carbohydrates and sugars and processed sugars and all the other garbage that are fed to the American public and all around the world now, which is why obesity is getting out of control around the world. It is the food. All right, uh, next question. Uh, what do I do if my heartbeat races, uh, starts to race while I'm on a dry fast? Well, that's pretty common. Uh, the Russian doctors talk about this as well, is that it's normal for the heart to seek normal, to, to go out of beat and, and, and race and slow down and all these kind of things, depending on what the body is requiring the heart and vascular pressure system to do for what it's doing at that moment during the auto, autophagic processes. So don't worry about it. What you do is you just lay down and deep breathe and just relax and meditate and you can lower your heartbeat that way. And, uh, but it's pretty much normal. I mean, if it keeps going for days on end, yeah, you probably wanna just exit the fast. But as far as heartbeat variations on a fast, very normal. Alrighty, let's see here. Okay, next question, number seven. I practically didn't sleep after day five of my seven day dry fast and was up most of the night for the last three days. But when I followed you on YouTube on one of your seven day dry fasts, you said you were doing all you're doing was sleeping. What is normal? To sleep or not to sleep? And what's normal is what's normal for you, as doctors used to say. Um, what happens is your body is going to require a specific amount of rest uh, to fix problems. Generally, when you're so tired, you can't stay up, your body's saying, come on, just come on, let's go to sleep here for a little bit. Take a nice nap in front of a big fan, which is what I like to do because the monotone sets me right out. Uh, sometimes I'll be up really late into the night, two, three in the morning. Um, my partner Pam is one of these people that when she gets into it, she gets into this awake all the time thing. Her circadian rhythms are completely messed up and resetting and everything. And so she's up day and night, sometimes for two or three days in a, in a row at the end of the fast. And it gets maddening. The best thing, the best thing you can do is just sit in a, in a nice warm bath and relax and calm down. Uh, sit outside uh, in the evening on a, on a chaise lounge and listen to, the, the, to nature at night, the, you know, the bats. Because <laughs> we're in Austin. Um, and just kind of take it easy. I mean, you'll be fine, really. Uh, let's see, is it okay to drink coffee and or green tea when I exit my seven day dry fast? Um, it depends on how you react to coffee and, and caffeine. Because caffeine and cocaine and all these other ene stimulants uh, hit specific parts of some people's brains but not others. And for instance, I can drink a pot of coffee and go straight to bed. It doesn't keep me up at all. It gets me going in the morning, it's nice and warm, it's a little stimulant, but it doesn't really ping me. Um, other people, uh, it really just jazzes them out. So yeah, you want to stay off of heavy stimulation, just like I said earlier, when you're recovering from a dry fast because you've got brand new baby cells and you got to take it easy on them. So I'd give it two or three days to get back into coffee and tea, even though I know for a lot of people, it's their lifeblood. <laughs> I understand that. Mine too, to some degree. But yeah, just knock it off for a couple of days after the fast is over, and then start reintroducing it. You'll be fine. Uh, at this time, at this time, I'm not able to afford all the supplements mentioned in the Phoenix Protocol as far as the program is concerned, the protocol. I will, uh, will I still get a, uh, all the benefits you mention in your book from just doing a seven-day dry fast? Well, yeah, that's the thing about a seven-day dry fast and what the Russians have found out. They, they've, they've figured out how to not eat and not drink over a certain amount of time to turn on specific acidosic crises to burn out viruses, burn out bacteria, burn out fungus, get rid of toxins and all that good stuff. And if you're on it long enough, Turn off PKA, activate your stem cells, you get a stem cell infusion, you get a lot of regeneration, and tissue remodeling, all that cool stuff. And um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the bigger benefit um, from just dry fasting alone. Now, when I invented the protocol, I saw that there are specific things that have to happen 
before and after protocol, they're probably a good idea. One is to introduce physitin, which we do, and physitin gets rid of senescent cells and causes some cells that are irretrievable to go into apoptosis and just exit the scene. So yeah, they're, it's, it's a great start because it takes the burden off the dry fast to get rid of those cells. That's cool. Uh, after the fast, stem cell region, polyphenol press, resveratrol, you want to be able to, with the stem cell, charge up your, activate your, your immune cells in the bone marrow, which make your blood system and all your immune system. You want to be able to activate or protect your mitochondria from rot reaction oxidative stress, that's what the polyphenols do. And you want to be able to turn on NAD+, which is what the resveratrol does. It turns on the enzyme that makes the NAD uh, five-fold more effective than some of the other methodologies currently being used. So yeah, what it does, it makes sure that your NAD is there for your sirtuins and your PARP and your mitochondrial actions and all that stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it just improves and enhances the protocol. Because again, my thing with this dry fasting is not to fix illnesses, which it certainly does in abundance. My thing is to use this to capitalize on the phenotypic plasticity of human beings to be able to remove all the toxins and then be able to have a body that's normally living like it was as a child again with such a low degree of toxins and a low degree of, of metabolic byproducts and stuff that the body can't help but just act younger. So that's what the protocol is all about is to improve that cleaning session, improve that regeneration session so that when you're not fasting your body's been restored back to a a, ch a childhood, adolescent level of, of methylation and toxins. So it's, it's just bound to work better. Um, so yeah, you can do a seven day dry fast and it'll be just great. So the thing about it is, you'll be able to get to every place else the guys with the supplements are getting, it's just a little slower. That's all it is. Um, okay, uh, I'm only able to do a shorter dry fast currently because of my work. I'm looking forward to doing a seven day dry fast later this year Am I getting any benefits from my two and three day dry fast? Yeah, I think I said so in an earlier video on short dry fast that the Russians have said that these are cumulative. So the benefits you get from cleaning things out, those don't go away, they've been cleaned out. And if you can only clean them out for two or three days, you're still cleaning them out for two or three days. Maybe after three weekends of doing this, you've done the same as a five or seven day dry fast as far as cleaning out your cells. You haven't really turned on your stem cells much, and that's, but that's okay, that's for the seven day but you have turned on autophagy, you've fixed a lot of the broken organelles and, and worn out organelles like the lysosome and the LAMP2A receptor site on the lysosomes, you've repaired um, uh, uh, your, uh, the internal parts of the, of the uh, cell, uh, like your, your mitochondria, so you're, you're, after the fast your body starts going to mitochondrial biogenesis, which it makes brand new mitochondria. So you're filling it up with all this cool stuff from just two or three day dry fast. It may take a little longer, but you'll get there, you know, just a little slower. All right, uh, let's see here. Okay, I'm on a budget and I want to take the supplements to augment my dry fast, but I, but can I cut down the amount of supplements each day, like taking half the dose? Sure. I mean, the dosage that we recommend is based off the research studies as the optimal therapeutic dose for the studies, um, correlated for human size and metabolism. But if you take it, you know, every other day, or instead of two pills, you take one pill. Um, yeah, you'll still get the benefits. It won't be as, in, as enhanced or as rapid, but you'll still get them over time, and it'll fit inside your budget that way. So that's my suggestion. If you can get, if you get them all, just take less of them, one every other day, or half the dose each day, or something like that, that's fine. Okay, next is... All right, number 12, I watched your YouTube video on short dry fast and I've taken advantage of those since I'm not able to schedule a seven day fast right now. Um, I feel great and have actually lost a lot of weight that has been impossible for me to lose in the past. My question is, should I just continue doing these two day fasts and not bother about trying to do a seven day? Well, that goes back to an earlier question, doesn't it? He's been doing these two day fasts because he can't do a seven and he's lost weight over the seven days that he's doing a two and five on. So they're, they're, that kind of proves the theory that it's a matter of not overstressing the body into a stress, hormonic stress to go into starvation packing of fat, but to merely switch it over to say, okay, well, there's no food today, I'll just get the stuff out of the fat cells, we'll be fine tomorrow. And then food starts again tomorrow, and the body's um, rewarded for that not going into trigger. And then the whole thing starts working to your benefits, where you start decreasing weight until you decide to stop. 
and you can stop at whatever set point you want. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that the, uh, uh, should, I, should I just continue doing these two-day fasts and not bother trying to do seven-day? Well, here's the thing. Uh, you can always do two-day fast, three-day fast, and that's fine. Get a good set point and stop at that weight. Um, then you don't really have to fast much at all. You uh, just live, eat the right food, eat enough protein to get muscle turnover, don't eat you know, toxic foods and processed foods. What did Michael Pollan say? He said, uh, uh, any food found from a plant, don't eat, but any food found in a plant, go ahead and eat. You know, it's, it's kind of a funny saying, but it's true. You don't want these things processed in these buildings because these buildings have denatured the stuff. They've taken all the goodness out. They've had to refortify it with vitamins and minerals. They've stripped out from the, from the stripping processes and stuff. So yeah, you want to have clean food, uh, grass-fed, grass-finished um, meats um, and chickens and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and again, if you're going vegan, you want to go ahead and make sure that that food is absolutely clean of glyphosate and these dangerous toxic chemicals that uh, damage your uh, endocrine system and are endocrine disruptors. So eat clean food, non-GMO, and avoid specific types of foods we'll talk, up, talk about in the next book. Uh, and you'll be fine in between one or two seven-day dry fasts a year because that's really kind of where we're going with this. Uh, at my age, I'm 69. I probably need two a year to make sure I can back my age up, demethylate my cells enough to start having youthful behavior again because youth is not measured in years. It's measured in functionality. And the idea here with this Phoenix Protocol and the next book is to make your body too young to die from old age. I mean, it's really a cool idea, and it looks like we're actually doing it. I've already lost two or three years on my DNA test. I'm now chronologically older than my DNA test. Um, so things are working in a positive way. But again, you might not want to fast all the time. You might want to just take that and get the benefits of losing all that excess weight, going from 200 down to 150, you know, over two or three months. That would take two or three years in a gym of sweating like a madman. So you just use the dry fasting to do a specific task, then stop using it for that task. Because if you've taken most of the stuff out of the cells from continual two and three day dry fast, and you've cleaned all that stuff out and all that metabolic garbage out, and you've cleaned the system out, you're probably doing just fine. And then you can drop off to one dry fast a year. You know, so the Phoenix Protocol is specifically geared for life extension. It certainly does all the dry fasting healing stuff. And that's great because you have to heal yourself to be strong enough and healthy enough and durable enough to, to live through an extended lifespan. So that's all we're really doing here. We're trying to get the body cleaned up, fixed up, and ready to go for a much longer time on Earth.